um, has a lot of classes that are open to serious auditors. Uh, you could come and audit a class. Uh, you can check out our, our website or you can, you can come out of my class. It's late at night, generally seven o'clock on Thursday nights. Um, so as long as you do the reading, uh, you are generally welcome to come. So just, you should know that that's a great opportunity out there. There's so many, especially now with Zoom, there's just a, a real, a real um, you know, embarrassment of riches. So let's go back to our, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint and, um, oh, oh uh, Rev Bolton, can you, can you make me a host? Robert, you're, you're, you're Let's see, am I hosting? Can I host yet? Let's see. Very good, very good. Okay, wonderful. Let's get started. So I'm gonna do a brief review. Um, you know, it's always a good idea. Um, okay, so, sorry, one minute. Okay. Okay, so we talked last week about um, the rise of the Converso class, um, the reasons why there was a push to have an inquisition to investigate the Conversos who were not practicing Catholicism faithfully and to weed out the, the, the minority of bad heretics from uh, from the majority of conversos who were like you know taking nature's path of of assimilation, the normal thing to do after two generations of living like a Catholic is to be a Catholic. Um, we talked about the weird mix of uh, of anti-converso sentiment, which often kept people in the realm of Judaism, reminding them that they were different, that they were not like the other Christians. Um, and then the, the, the Inquisition arguing, you know, with some justification, that as long as open Jews are living among, side by side generally, their converso brethren, um, the conversos are never going to fully assimilate. So, you know, that was the major argument. Um, and so the Inquisition came and said, let us investigate, let us separate the heretics from, from, the, good, from the good Christians. Um, and after 10 years, um, the crown felt that this wasn't working. And upon the conquest of Granada, you talked about the important geopolitical issues there, the last Muslim kingdom, the last major war of reconquest against the Muslims, the crown felt it was important at that moment to consolidate. And many historians read this as a move to create really a monoculture, um, to solidify the, the, the burgeoning nation state of, of Spain as a fully Catholic country without minorities. Um, and the Jews were the easiest minorities and the ones who were most you know, intertwined religiously um, to get rid of. So that, that's one of, that's, that is a reading of the events. Um, it's interesting just from, a, from a, a linguistic point of view. 1492 is the year that many things happened, as we all know. Um, besides the expulsion from Spain um, and Columbus's journeys of discovery, um, a, a book came out, which to Spanish ling linguists and, and lovers of the language is a very important event. Um, Antonio Nebrija, who was the tutor of Queen Isabella when she was a child and a, and a very important uh, humanist, he put out a grammar of Castilian. So a grammar of what we normally call Spanish. And you may say, well, why am I talking about this? Well, because when you have a grammar for the dominant political language in a peninsula that's filled with many different languages, even to this day, if you go to an ATM machine in Spain, you'll find Catalan, you'll find Castilian, you'll find Basque, you'll find 
uh, Gallego. Um, and so, um, but one language became the language of power and the language of empire, and that became Castilian. And so when Nebrija publishes this, um, this grammar, it's interesting what he writes as a dedication to the queen, who again, like I said, was his uh, student when she was a young child. And he says, because everyone knows that language goes along with empire and the health of one affects that of the other, right? So there's this sense that um, this consolidation of the empire, of the, of the nation state in Spain, and then the burgeoning um, fa fact of the, empire, of the empire abroad. I mean, think about it, it's very interesting. Spanish is a language which is spoken in Spain, in Mexico, in the Caribbean, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. And the differences between these different countries and the way they speak Spanish is very, very minor. And that can only be attributed to a very imperial hierarchical um, move and also a move that really wants, like I said, a monoculture. Um, okay, that's just something to think about and consider. So here's the edict of expulsion. Remember the Inquisition was before and the Inquisition lasted afterwards. Uh, but it, you know, the, the thing which forced Jews to leave Spain en masse in great numbers and also pushed many Jews to convert in order to not have to leave the only country they knew was this edict, which was signed after that conquest in Granada. Um, and I'll just a little, again, a little review. You know, the Jews who left, they went into the heart of the Mediterranean, they went to Italy, Turkey, North Africa, the largest group going to Portugal, which is, was important last week, it's gonna be important again this week. We talked about the importance of trade in Portugal. It's a tiny little seafaring nation where trade became very, very important. Um, when the Jews, you know, obviously 1492 opens up the world, but Europeans didn't really understand what was found for a long time. And the real focus was not the Americas. The focus of trade was India. You can see this map, it's not so exact. Africa, the Spice Islands. And that's exactly where the Portuguese were going. It was, the focus was not the Americas for a very long time. Um, but the Portuguese who, who really developed these trade routes along the African coast to India, they had a very strong trade with the East. And when Columbus discovers the Americas, over time, they become very important, not only for trade, but more importantly for colonization, for extraction of minerals, for conquest and everything we know that comes after um, 1492. We have Columbus being greeted in this imaginary scene. Um, and we saw that even Columbus himself saw how his great adventure, his great act of heroism to go out into the unknown was paired with the crown's great act of heroism, which was expelling the Jews. We talked about conversion. This is, a, this is an image of Muslims convert, being converted in, in Granada. Uh, we talked about that last week. This is a bit of a sketch of where we're gonna go today, timeline-wise. So I, I, I would link 1391 as the birth of Maronism, birth of crypto-Judaism, of the converso reality. Those are different things, but they're related. Um, with those riots, you now have all these forced converts. Among them, there are people who are committed in their hearts to Judaism and pass it on to their children and create a elaborate uh, you know, system of crypto Judaism, but that's a minority. But the problem, as we saw, is that 1391 wasn't a one off event. There are waves of conversions, there are waves of persecutions, there are waves of, of missionizing. And then finally, with 1492, that pushes even more Jews to convert in order to survive. Um, the Spanish conquer Mexico in 1523, 1525. That is their first real encounter with a major civilization in the Americas. And quickly after that, Pizarro takes over the Incas. And so by the 1530s, 
The Spanish have control of these major, major population centers. This attracts thousands and thousands of Spaniards and other Europeans, but mostly Spaniards, to come and settle in the Americas. It also attracts all sorts of, among those people, of conversos who are coming to the Americas for all sorts of reasons, um, mostly economic, and often, if not outright to keep Judaism, then at least to leave behind the memory of, of the persecution and the limitations of what we saw last week and the week before of blood purity laws, of limpieza de sangre laws that kept conversos limited in their careers, in their lifestyles. Um, and so you leave your little town where everyone knows that your father converted or your grandfather converted or whatever it is. You come to Cuba and then you move to Mexico and maybe you move to Guatemala. Guess what? You can tell people that you were the, you know, you were the, the prince of the town and no one will know the difference. You could become whoever you want. That's always been the promise of America for Europeans. Just leave it all behind and create yourself anew. Among all those people, we have conversos. We have a lot of good old Christians, you know, Spanish Christians who are behaving badly. They're far away. They're married in Spain, but they remarry. They marry someone else in, in Mexico because your wife's far away. That's bigamy. That's heresy. That has to be investigated. Uh, you have people contracting with, in, with indigenous curanderos, indigenous um, healers and witches, uh, invoking all sorts of strange, um, you know, potions and, and, and especially in the realm of, of romance to try to um, lure and keep their lovers. Um, that's also a problem. That's a big no-no. You're, you're Catholic. You shouldn't be dealing with these, with these Indian gods and goddesses. Um, so they establish an inquisition in Mexico and then in Lima. Um, in the 1570s, to police the purity of the church. Among that purity, you have, like I said, all sorts of random acts of Catholics behaving badly, and you have this concern for conversos, which, uh, which, which increases after 1580. And those of you who read Yerushalmi, that date will be very clear. Yerushalmi makes a, makes a very strong argument that he makes, brings with a lot of evidence that 1580 is the year that the crown of Portugal gets subsumed into Spain, and it allows Portuguese subjects to move freely throughout the Spanish empire, and vice versa. Which means that conversos from Portugal can now go to Madrid, they can go to Seville, the main port for the Americas, they can go to Mexico, they can go to Lima, they do business in these places, um, and, and as we remembered, the conversos were part of these large, oh, you know, Atlantic, transatlantic, even really, really global trade networks. And so, of course, they're going to want to go to Mexico City. Of course, they want to do business in Cuba. Of course, they want to make their way to Lima, you know, which be, is flowing with silver that's coming out of the mountains. Um, and they're going to go all the way to Manila and on the flotillas from Acapulco going to Manila, and they're gonna to go to India. Now, again, most of these conversos, they don't care about Judaism. They're looking to make a buck, they're looking to, to, to live their lives, but the authorities are worried that these Portuguese, who are not exactly like them, are bringing in not only contraband goods and all sorts of things, they're bringing in heresy. That among these Portuguese conversos, um, you will have a fair number of people who are committed in some fashion to the dead law of Moses. And that is a problem, and that's why they established the Inquisition. And they, they even established a, a third one in Cartagena, in the uh, northern coast of South America and modern-day Colombia, uh, which was a very important port that would then lead into the Andes from the Caribbean. Why? Why those ports? Why would you make it in a major market centers and ports? For the obvious reasons, because those are the people you're worried about, the people who go back and forth and traffic and all sorts of things. Um, by 1639, most networks of crypto Jews in South America 
um, have been snuffed out, have been found out, have been persecuted, have been um, burnt at the stake in out of the phase. And the last one was in 1639. This could be a class for itself. It's a fascinating geopolitical and religious um, uh, event. Um, what was known as the Great Conspiracy. We can say that for another time. And notice what happens around here. Around here, we start to see what we're going to talk about at the end of the class, the beginnings um, and the tribulations of former conversos, people who, who moved to Portugal in 1497, who were forced in 1492, were forcibly converted five years later, who maintained an identity as, as a converso class, regardless of their religiosity, for generations who end up making their way to the freedom of places like Amsterdam and London, coming to the Americas and setting up colonies, you know, setting up communities that were open Jewish communities in the heart of America. And the first one was in Recife in Brazil. It lasted for under 30 years while the Dutch controlled that port. Um, and it's from there that the other Caribbean and eventually North American Jewish communities um, um, was, were propagated. Um, and we'll talk about that. So this is a bit of a, I just gave you kind of the sweep of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, okay. Um, this is, we're gonna talk, we're, I'm gonna use one guy and we, we mentioned him last week. Um, his name is Luis de Carvajal. This is the first book on his family. His fa he, along with many members of his family, were arrested in 1589 and then again in 1595, which means that we have a tremendous amount of documentation on this family. And we have it even from before, because this Luis de Carvajal had, this Luis de Carvajal had a uncle, also named Luis de Carvajal, who uh, was given the right to be the governor of a, of a, of a territory in northern Mexico, uh, what is today in the area of Monterrey. And in fact, if you go to Monterrey, you'll see there's a, there's a big statue of him. Okay, so we have a lot of information about this family, which means a historian's dream, right? You can spend years and years reading all these old transcripts and write a huge tome like this one. And this was originally published in, in the late 30s by the, by the Mexican historian Alfonso Toro. Um, those of you who want to read a little more, I, I sent a translation of, of his autobiography by Mark, Martin Cohen, who should live and be well. Um, and uh, this is a collection of his writings, the writings of Luis de Carvajal by Seymour Liebman, who, um, also dedicated a lot of his years of scholarship to Carvajal and the family and translated these letters very beautifully. Um, this is my book. Um, the picture, by the way, comes from a, a Mexican artist, um, Eduardo Cohen, uh, whose, um, whose widow was very generous and, and was happy for me to use the picture, as long as I told people. And he's a wonderful artist from Mexico. Okay, family, 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 family. This is the family tree of the Carvajals. We know a lot about them, like I said. Um, and here's our Joseph, he has sisters. Um, these are his parents. What's interesting about this family is that we know if you scratch just a little about a generation or two, it goes back to Portugal. So, and these are basically Spanish Jews who did that journey that Yershami talked a lot about, right? They, they decided that they were going to stay Jewish. They left everything behind and moved to Portugal. But then Portugal made them, Jew made them Catholics. And where do they go? They go back into Spain. They go back into the Spanish world because there's opportunities there. Um, and so that's another thing to, to look at. This is, this is Luis de Carvajal, the governor. This is a statue to him in Monterrey, a little biography of him. Um, this was the territory he was given. It's not a great place to live. Swamps, um, deserts, and, um, and a lot of nomadic Indian tribes that were not happy to see Europeans. 
but there was silver and that was a good thing. Um, his, his, his manuscripts were stolen in 1932 from the archive, um, but they were recuperated in 2016 by Leonard Milberg, a, a New York uh, financier and, uh, and book collector who had the good sense and the sagacity to um, alert the FBI and the Mexican authorities when he was offered this book for purchase from Swan Gallery. He remembered hearing that this was a stolen object. This is, you can see his beautiful handwriting. Um, he was trained as a scribe. And it's, it's kind of amazing to be able to read it. I, I lived with this book in, in its transcribed form that was transcribed Alfonso Torre in, in the 1930s before this theft. Um, but when it was in New York uh, for a while at the New York Historical, I got the chance to see it. It's really incredible to see his writings. Um, this is how he starts his autobiography. Um, en el nombre Dios Adonai Tsevaot de los ejércitos. So, in the name of God Adonai Tsevaot. I mean, this is what we guess, right? Because there's because every letter means something, right? Uh, Señor. The, sir, the Lord of hosts, Hashem Tzavakot. Um, that's how he starts his autobiography, this kind of, um, you know, calling out. And, you know, in this, there's so much. There's just so much. I mean, you know, here you have a guy who's, who comes to Mexico when he was 14, 15, living this double life. He he knows he is Jewish. He wants to live a Jewish life. He doesn't know what that means. He, he was lucky enough to have a good education in a Catholic school. And so he can read Latin. And one of the fascinating things to see is how he takes from Catholic texts and creates a Judaism. Um, it's an idiosyncratic Judaism. It's not, doesn't look like Judaism you know. But this is a great example. So, um, you know, this, this phrase, Lord of hosts, you can find it in Tehillim, in the Psalms, you can find it in, um, in, in, in Isaiah. You can also find it in Mass. One of the standard Masses includes this line. So, Luis de Carvajal, who reads Latin um, and is searching for Jewish content within the Catholic text, could take out this verse from, which is very, very central to Judaism, but he's taking it out from a Catholic mass. And he's putting it here as his, his, you know, his opening line. So you see, you know, kind of the creativity necessary um, um, to, to, to create. Um, in, in the autobiography, he explains that when he was 13, his mother and siblings introduced him to Judaism and he immediately saw the truth of it and he, he embraced it. But one of the cool things about Luis de Carvajal is that he is a person who wants to create meaning for himself. He wants to craft a Judaism um, which is personal, which is idiosyncratic, which is almost like God talking to him. And what better way for God to talk to you directly than by reading the Bible? Um, and he talks about it here in the, this is from the autobiography, that God provided him a holy Bible. So he's walking on the road, no one's around. He meets a monk and the monk sells him the Bible. Now you may say, well, okay, why wouldn't he sell him the Bible? The problem is this is after Trent. This is after the, the, you know, the Council of Trent this is part of, this is counter-reformation, um, Iberian world. Bibles, even in Latin, are for official people. They're for priests. They're not for some converso who's walking around, you know, kind of selling, selling trinkets in Mexico City. Um, and yet he gets his hands on it because guess what? The rules are rules and rules are breached. Um, they're honored in the breach, as they say. And he gets his access to this. Look what he does next. I won't get into the details, but you can see. He finds the first mitzvah, 
What's the first mitzvah say? It's what Avram is, is commanded to do and to do to all his children upon their eighth day in the world. And he realizes he needs to do it for himself. Um, circumcision would have been something that a crypto Jew living in the Iberian world under the Inquisition would not perform. Because when the Inquisition would arrest you, God forbid, they will inspect you. They have a surgeon on hand and he comes in and he checks you out. And if he sees in a man signs of, of circumcision, that raises many red flags. So we know that overall crypto Jews almost never circumcise themselves. There are very few cases and they're, they're, they stand out. Karvachal is one of these. Then his brother, then he helps his brother circumcise himself. Um, we have a few other cases, but it's rare. Um, another little, you know, the way he Judaizes the Catholic or Catholicizes the Jewish, if you look towards here on the bottom, you know, you know, with great zeal and burning desire, describing the book of life, with which without these holy sacrament, it is impossible. Now, in all the verses around circumcision, we don't have this, we don't have a term that could be like sacrament, which is a very Catholic, heavy Catholic idea. Um, also, Book of Life is not said there anywhere. Book of Life is, is, is really a second temple. You see it in, in some of the apocryph apocryphal stuff. It gets, makes its way to Chazal that way. Um, I think it's mentioned in Isaiah once. And it's a big deal in the New Testament. Um, so it's really interesting, right, how he's kind of crafting this for himself. Um, we talked about this guy last week, the week before. You know, it's a very important, idea, you know, kind of iconic image of the war between the Christians and the Muslims from the Christian point of view. This is St. James the Morse Slayer who um, is, the, is the patron saint of Spain. His, his, burial, his mythic burial place in Santiago in, in the north of Spain is a, you know, the most popular pilgrimage site after, after Rome. But notice what happens when you come to the Americas. There aren't Muslims down here. Who's being trampled by St. James the Moor Slayer? indigenous warriors, right? And he gets a new name, Santiago Mata Indios, St. James the Indian Killer. Now this is of course, lives parallel to the enormous effort made by missionaries to convert Indians, because the two are related. Um, and you see this in a place like this monastery, St. Santiago, notice the name, Santiago, St. James again, of Tartelolco. Um, a lot of the indigenous uh, languages in Mexico have, have tons of consonants in places that we would never put them. So, um, Tartelolco. Anyways, um, this monastery was established uh, by, by missionaries to educate the elite of the, of the Indian upper classes, to teach them Latin and to, and to expose them to Christianity in a very thorough way. It was also a place of tremendous intellectual experimentation. There was a lot of um, kind of case studies of indigenous religion, people going out to the villages, learning the languages, and all the codices that many of you are familiar with, these Aztec codices, were all produced in this monastery, almost all of them. After Carvajal is arrested for the first time, he's given a light sentence because he pleads for, he begs for forgiveness. And he's given, a, he's given a job as penitence of being a teacher of Latin and the assistant to the rector of this monastery. Um, I'm sorry, and it's so here, that he gets access to many, many more of these Catholic books, right? These books which um, he's able to take off the shelves and he had the cover that he was transcribing things for the rector. But he would go in at night when no one was looking because he had the keys and he would take down a volume of, let's say, 
Nicholas of Lyra or Oliaster. These were, you know, very important late medieval, early Renaissance um, commentators on the Torah, on the Bible, on the on different parts of 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 the of the Bible, who were fiercely anti-rabbinic, but in order to demolish, in their view, the rabbinic interpretations, they would quote long sections of rabbinic texts and then say, oh, look how wrong Rashi is. Look how silly the rabbis are. Oh, look how misguided Maimonides was. But in the medieval style, you cite the entire passage. Because remember, they didn't have Google. So if you want your student, you know, 200 miles away, understanding your argument, you need to quote the entire thing. And you see this on a Jewish parallel, you'll see this in the Ramban, let's say, Nachmanides, and his commentary will often cite large sections of Maimonides or Ibn Ezra or Rashi that he was going to then critique and use. So here you have this very driven, very creative and audacious um, crypto Jew who is ostensibly doing penitence for his heresy, being able to go to the library and extract and create an anthology of Jewish sources from these Catholic works. Um, so that's one way that he creates Jewish text in his own, you know, for his own reason. But there's something else, and this is going to get us to the second half of tonight, which is the Jews who left Spain and Portugal and found safe haven in Italy and in Turkey and in North Africa, the majority of them just stayed in those places. They found a home, they settled you know, new communities, and the rest is Sephardic history. Um, but many of them, their, their, their parnasa, their way of making money was through international trade, was from getting on a boat, going somewhere, selling, buying, bringing back. So we know that there was a wide network of these Sephardic Jews who were based in port cities like Venice or in Turkey um, or in Tunis, who were doing business with Spain, who were doing business with further afield. Um, and then we have other people who, for weird reasons, would come back into the Iberian world after finding safety, often because economically they were unstable, right? They, you know, maybe they were successful in Spain, but they moved to Italy and they lost their contacts. They lost their, you know, they lost their footing and they never made it. Um, and here we have a story. This is again from Carvajal's um, autobiography um, of how Carvajal got his hands on what I would say normative Jewish prayer, right? Basically the text of a Sidur. Um, so he says, how did I get it? You know, how did I get, you know, the, with the prayers, that, the, the devout prayers with which the Lord is invoked and prays in Israelite synagogues by the wise people, the chosen ecclesia of the Lord. It's very interesting. He could have used the Spanish word, but instead he uses the Catholic word, the Latin word of ecclesia, which is generally used to talk about the church. Right, Spanish Ecclesia, right, Ecclesia. Um, but it's his way of saying Kehila, right? But it's in Latin because that's, that's the language he knows. But anyways, how did he get his hands on it? Oh, uh, so he says, the means through which his holiness brought this good thing from our brothers who live free to observe the law of the most high God without restrictions to the lands of his captivity was through a servant of his, one of those who live in the diaspora of Italy. So we get to Italy. And Italy is this very, very important place. It's the place where Luis and his family wanted to move, or they said they wanted to move, and that, until they had this opportunity to go to Mexico. Because Italy had a patchwork of places that allowed Jews to live, and even turned a blind eye to former conversos. So imagine a Catholic country saying, Oh, it's okay. We know we're gonna we're gonna, you know, it's it's a it's a um, an open secret that you guys were Catholics just ten days ago, you know, um, in in Spain. But here you're gonna be Jews. That's the 
and they there were contracts you know contracts with with these ex conversos allowing them and giving them protection anyways so here we have an italian jew it says this individual is so poor that he made this with this meaning this sidur this kind of collection of jewish prayers that carvajal calls in spanish um, something that I translated as sustenance for the soul. Matalotaje, Spanish is like rations that like soldiers or sailors take with them on journeys. So imagine like, you know, spiritual sustenance. Translated these holy prayers into Portuguese and Spanish and came on pilgrimage to this new world. And then when he left, he left this prayer book with Carvajal and others. So there's all these different ways Carvajal can learn, or, or any crypto Jew could learn about Judaism from his family. He can learn it from books if he's very, very smart and crafty and figures out ways to subvert um, you know, the Catholic structures. Um, and he gets it from Jews from open communities that find their way to Mexico or Lima or Brazil for all sorts of reasons. Now, they're a minority, but doesn't mean they didn't exist and doesn't mean they're not important and really kind of wild to think about. And uh, this is the last thing from Carvajal we'll look at tonight. This comes from his full manuscript of his personal writings. Um, take a look at this. See if you can make out any of these things. What words do you see? Now, a lot of these are transliterated from Hebrew. I'll give you a hint. There were the months on the right. Very good. Kislev, Tebet, right? Um, here, down here we have Echad, Shnaim, Pesach, Shavuot, Tammuz, Tishnam Be'av, uh, which, by the way, if you spend any time in Spanish Portuguese at Sheriff, Israel, you'll notice that when they say an ayin, it often has a, a very guttural N sound to it. You see that here, Tishnam Be'av, um, Rosh Hashanah, Gedalia. These are all the holidays, and here are the dates when they fall out, which is in the month, in the, in the, in the uh, Catholic month. Um, and it goes for two years. So he somehow managed to do this. I assume, I, I'm, I'm currently doing research on this actual page, and I, 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 the summer has not been a normal summer of research, but I hope to better understand where he got this information from. Um, if there were books circulating or if there was a way, again, from Catholic sources to do, to, com to compute it. But it's an amazing, to me, I look at this page and I see, uh, you know, a technology of resistance, you know, a way that, that someone living far away from an open community can figure out how to hold on to their faith and how to, how to create holy time um, when, you know, if, you know, if you've spent time in Catholic countries um, or, or really, you know, any country that's predominantly one religion, you know, if you spend time in a Muslim country, you'll have the same sense that the time, it's not neutral, right? The, the hours of the day are marked by either call of prayer or the bells of the, of the cathedral and the, and the, and the, saints holidays all those things mark time so much to have a jewish calendar is such an act of of resistance and and count really a very countercultural move um the the story of the carvajal is actually um has an afterlife um so much so that this you know you can find this is the sister of carvajal mariana Car the carvajal uh at an auto de fe depicted by, by Diego Rivera. Um, all right, now, so I, we talked about the Jews who went to the, to the Mediterranean. Um, and just to give you a sense of the importance of that sense of exile, of being cast out from this country that was so important to them into this new world, this comes from a Spanish Bible um, look at this beautiful sketch, al Canfe Nesharim, you have this eagle, and you have, this is a biblical scene, you can make it out, who might it be? 
it's it's Yaakov and 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 Joseph, you know, when they reunite. But again, you have the sense of movement, diaspora, exile, reunion, coming together, um, and this you can you can see that eagle down there, very beautifully done. Um, Bible in the Spanish language, translated word for word from the Hebrew truth by very excellent uh, lettered, you know, humanists. Um, and just a little note, it's been uh, checked by the Inquisition for any possible heresies. Um, this is originally from Ferrara, um, and it's republished in Amsterdam. Um, so Ferrara was one of those Italian cities that gave Jews and even former crypto Jews um, safe haven. And you can see, you know, the testament of the need for a Bible in Spanish because these Jews are coming without any Hebrew. Um, so that's Italy, that's, that's the Mediterranean. But what I want to look at is these Portuguese Jews, in particular, they go to the Americas, like I said. They often, there's an irony that Rishami also talked about, which is that at the point when the Portuguese Inquisition was on a furious tear against the conversos in Portugal, which was around the 1540s to the 1580s, that was a period of time that many Portuguese conversos found it convenient to move into Spain, to go to Madrid, to go to Seville. And they were attracted for two reasons. Number one, the Inquisition was less focused on, on Jews at that point, was more focused on Lutherans and others. Um, but also there was tremendous new opportunities in Spain. Um, Madrid was the center of the largest empire in Europe, in fact, the world, because the Habsburgs controlled much of Europe, Italy, parts of North Africa, the Americas, the Philippines, and Seville in the south of Spain was the official port for the Americas. So any boat going in and going to or back from the Americas to Spain had to stop in Seville, a very lucrative place to be. Now, they also go to the Netherlands, right? The Netherlands were controlled by the Habsburgs. So it was a Catholic controlled place, but there was no inquisition. You couldn't openly practice Judaism, but you wouldn't be persecuted for it either. So you start seeing already in the 1530s, Portuguese conversos moving their businesses to Antwerp, which was a major port for inland trade, and little by little moving into the Northern Netherlands to Amsterdam. And when Amsterdam kicks out the Spanish by the end of the 16th century, they, they, they make a deal really unofficially with a small group of conversos who say we're Jewish, we're not Catholics, please let us settle here and let us do business here and, and we will keep our religion quiet. And that starts in, in, in really turn of the 17th century. By 1534, um, by six, I'm sorry, by 16, by the 1630s, um, they have three congregations that merge into one and they create, um, they have their first synagogue. Um, this is the symbol this community chooses. It's a phoenix rising from the fire. By 1676, they can put up this amazing structure. It's one of the most amazing uh, Jewish buildings from the early modern period. Um, it's still there. Luckily, the Nazis didn't bomb it or, 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 or burn it down. Um, and and this is the, the, the Portuguese synagogue of Amsterdam. Um, and I wanna just, this is the interior. Give you a sense of the grandeur of this building. Um, it was a, you know, it was a tourist attraction. People would come wanting to see, you know, let us, you know, 
they, they would write, oh, I made it in time to see the Jews at prayer. The reason, one of the reasons why it was so exciting to see Jews at prayer, one reason was, is that in most of Western Europe, there were no Jews. You know, we think of the Jews of Ashkenaz. They were kicked out a long time ago. There were no Jews in France. There were some Jews in Alsace, some Jews throughout, peppered throughout Germany, but none of them had a synagogue like this. None of them had a synagogue in the center of town in a beautiful neighborhood, right? That was open, that was, that was glorious, that they were proud of. Um, even the beautiful synagogues of Venice were behind very simple facades and they were tiny, right? But this is a large imposing building. Um, and so you, and the other piece is that these non-Jews were curious, wow, these aren't the Jews I know. The Jews I know were poor, they, they live in these small ghettos. Um, these Jews are wealthy, they're cosmopolitan, they speak la many European languages, they're exotic, right? They're from Portugal. Um, and they're part of a larger network. Because, I'm sorry, let me go back here for a second to this map. So this is a nice map. You see these Portland lines? These tell you the, the most direct way to go from one port to another. Um, you know, by, by the early part of the 17th century, Spain is not the only one, and Portugal are not the only ones with global empires. Um, France is moving into North, North America. Um, England is going into North America and starting to stretch itself. And the Dutch know that they can never really have a large territory, but they could have trade networks. They could do business. They could import, export in Africa, in the Far East, in the Americas. The Dutch get hold of small holdings in the Americas. They take over the northern port of Recife in Brazil for 30 years. They take over the small island of Curaçao, which actually no one wanted because nothing grows there. The only thing going for Curaçao is that it has a port, um, a very good port, and it's close to places to do business. They take over Suriname, right, which is a very large area, um, very, very, um, you know, rural. Um, and with this, the Jews of Amsterdam find new opportunities for themselves and in places where they could be fully Jewish. That is the, the novelty. You know, these conversos figured out ways of going to the Americas, of going to Africa, of going to Belgium, um, but they always had to hide. Now, because of, because, because of the Dutch, the Dutch gave Jews um, religious rights in these places because they wanted to encourage settlement and trade. This was not coming from the goodness of their heart, right? This is, you know, maybe it was in individual cases. I don't know the heart, but I know that bottom line, they were interested in business. They were interested in trade and what was good for their economy and their, poli their politics. And the Jews were good for that. And to that extent, they gave them rights and allowed them to settle. So look here. This is the synagogue in Curaçao, in Williamstead. You see the parallels? You can see the columns, you can see the chandeliers, also the structure of all these synagogues all follow the same pattern. Um, you have the Teva, the Hasfaradim call the, the, the Abima, right? The Teva, the Ark, the right? place where you read the Ark, the, the Torah. Um, the, the, and then you have the windows all along. Interesting thing about the synagogue. The Yodekirk, the Jewish church, um, is listed as number 17 on this map. It's on the map. It's on the main street of the, of the main port town of Williamstead. Um, it's not hidden. I'm going to go back to these for a second. Um, Menashe ben Israel, um, a, one of the first rabbis to be trained in Amsterdam in the heart of the community. Um, in other words, his parents lived like Catholics, moved when he was a baby uh, to Amsterdam, 
and he was raised in the community, became a great rabbi, um, wrote very wide variety of books, um, and often with an eye towards a Christian audience. He had a lot of, of dialogues with different Christian theologians and, and, and princes, um, a pretty stunning guy. Now, there's, there's a suspicion this was done by Rembrandt. There's a bit of a machloket about that. But, you know, how many uh, European rabbis were being painted by Rembrandt? Um, England. This is Bevis Marx. Um, still in functioning today. Uh, a dear friend and a former student of mine, Rabbi Shalom Morris, is the rabbi of uh, Bevis Marx. And um, this is still a functioning synagogue. This was the first open Jewish community in, in, um, in England. And this painting gives you a sense of the transatlantic nature of this community. This painting done in the 18th century was painted by Mendes Belisario. Belisario um, is considered one of the great Jamaican uh, artists, was of Spanish Portuguese origin and a very proud Jew. Um, and he, on a trip to England, painted Bevis Marx. Um, here you see Recife, Suriname. This we're going to go next. We'll stay, we'll stay in Recife for a second. First of all, this is a discovered mikvah in Recife, in, in near the synagogue. This is the first rabbi of Recife. This is him when he's older. This is Abuab, Isaac Abuab a great Kabbalist, a great jurist, a great um, orator, um, wrote poetry in Hebrew, um, and uh, all around a very imposing personage, as you can see here. Um, his Iberianness can be found here, this little, you see that? You see that coat of arms, right? He's very proud of being Isaac Aboab de Fonseca, right? Nice, nice classic Portuguese name there. Um, the Brazilian government um, celebrating Recife and the, the Keila. Um, just an interesting note about how Jews name things. We talked about the beginning of the class that the name Sepharad, how it became associated with the peninsula, with the Iberian Peninsula, um, you know, that it's a biblical word and then it gets attached to this. So look what the Jews did here. Recife means coral reef because there's these very, very imposing coral reefs all around um, Recife. What name do they give themselves? They call themselves Sur Israel, the Rock of Israel, playing off of the, of the physical surroundings. Um, so when the Portuguese retake Recife from the Dutch, the, the, the Dutch were given you know, the, the opportunity to leave you know, under pretty good terms. And they even allowed the Jews to leave, um, which was a little bit extraordinary considering that many of those Jews were born Catholic. But the Dutch insisted that the Jews, regardless of their past, be allowed to leave um, for freedom. And um, some of them went to Curacao. Most went back to Amsterdam. And some came to uh, an island called New Amsterdam. And in 1654, were the first um, organized group of Jews there. There were Jews before who were, who were living there. There was Asher, uh, I believe his name was Asher Levy, an Ashkenazi Jew from Holland and whatnot. But, but the point is that 1654 is like the beginning of a organized Jewish community. Um, and this is Suriname. The synagogue is right here. This is the what's known as the Yodin Savanna, the, the Jewish Savanna of Suriname. And it's interesting, according to the Talmud, the synagogue should be in the highest point of a town. But in exile, when either Christians or Muslims are in charge, Jews can't control that. In fact, the law is in, in medieval times, the synagogue had to be lower than the majority religions building. But in, in Suriname, because there was no other authorities, the Jews controlled this area, they could put their synagogue on the highest point and it could be the center of town. 
The Jews who lived in, Europe, in, in the Savannah were agricultural. So this was a place of Jews living with their African slaves. Um, and it's an enormously complex, fascinating chapter in Jewish history and in American history, um, which obviously these days has a lot more re re relevance you know, to our minds, I think. Um, these are tombstones from Curacao. Um, fascinating to see, first of all, the languages, right? Portuguese and use of Hebrew as well. Um, this person, this is, this is cut off, I'm sorry, but this is a, the, the person who decided he's a Mordechai. And up here you have Mordechai Yatsa Lifne Hamelech. You have Haman leading Mordechai with the horse and right, this, that scene. The skull and crossbones has led many people to say, oh, this must be a pirate. But it either means it's just a momentous mori, right, a uh, meditation on death, or that this person might have been a part of the Hebra Kadisha, right, the, uh, the burial society. Charleston, look at the same structure, right? The columns, the teva, all the way at the, you know, one end, and then a long space till you get to the, to the, to the Heichal, the Aron, where the Torah is, the use of the Ten Commandments. That's something that the Portuguese Jews started in Amsterdam. We don't really see that before. Um, this was done by, this, this painting of the synagogue in Charleston was done by, by Carvalho. Carvalho was a Portuguese Jew who went on, he left Charleston and, and went west and one of, was one of the great early um, North American painters of the West and had a very beautiful um, way of painting, you know, the wild scenes of the West and Native Americans and things like that. This is what the building looked like on the outside, which I find interesting. It looks like a nice Protestant church. But on the inside, you're part of the Spanish Portuguese diaspora, right? Um, and this is a ketuba, uh, and it's interesting for many reasons. First of all, it's very beautiful. Um, if you look at the, um, it's between, it's a mixed marriage between Ashkenaz and Sephardi. And you see that also in the Edim. You have an Ephraim Hart, who's an Ashkenaz, and you have Moises Peixoto, a, a Portuguese. Um, so you have that happening pretty early on in, in North America. Um, most, of these, most of these congregations keep their Sephardic identity as Nusach in terms of prayer rite and, and traditions, but they become majority Ashkenaz, you know, certainly, certainly by, by, by the Civil War, if not earlier. Um, so that's just an interesting thing. Um, I want to end with this fascinating little tidbit. Um, this is a copy of a transcription of a, of a sermon preached in Newport, Rhode Island, at, the Torah, at what's known as the Torah Synagogue, um, on Shavuot by the Venerable Hochum, which is the way Sephardim call rabbis, the learned rabbi Haim Isaac Karigal of the city of Hebron near Jerusalem in the Holy Land. Um, and so this, 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 this great rabbi from Hebron why was he in Newport? What was he doing in Newport? He was raising funds. He was doing what Shlichim have done for hundreds of years. He was at the same time raising funds, teaching people, building up the diaspora, diasporic connections. Um, this was part of a much larger trip. He was also in the Caribbean, um, part of this circuit, right? Um, and there's been some great work on Karigal. My friend, Laura Liebman, um, her book um, includes, one of her books includes chapter two on Karigal. He's a fascinating in, the individual. Um, and so, and I'll end there because it connects us back to the old world, um, but we're in the new world and it gets us pretty close to New York. So I think it's a good place to stop and ask you know, for questions. I have a question in terms of the kind of, 
Let me stop sharing so I can see. All right. I, um, in terms of the conversos, how organized in, in Latin America and in Portugal were they, you know, was, was it the small cells or were they, you know, bigger groups? And if they weren't organized, how did they go about organizing? Yeah. Great question. What it's 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 all of the above because they're not one group, right? So they're not uniform. One of the ways that you can think about the way that they were organized was in a socioeconomic sense, was these larger family networks, business related family networks. That was a very important way that they were connected. And and I wanted to give you a taste of that with the Carvajals that you have a situation where you have this big extended family and re religiously, they could be really, really different, right? I mean, they, you had the uncle who was a passionate Catholic who tried to recreate himself like a Hidalgo, like a Spanish nobleman who through war and conquest and, and you know, right, goes up the ladder of power to his you know, to Car Luis de Carvajal's family, um, who were kind of mid-level merchants, who seem to have had some members who were devout, devoutly connected to Judaism, others who weren't, but they were all in the same family, right? They were all connected in that way. So organiza from organizationally, from like that socioeconomic network, it's very impressive and surprising. One of the things that we've learned is that often, to solidify those bonds, not only through marriage, you also do it through a form of, um, I guess I would say like good nepotism, but literally nepotism, whereby nephews spend time with uncles. So instead of me um, apprentice, you know, having my son apprentice with me, I'll have my nephew come and live with me for a few years and work in the business where I live. And maybe my son will do the same with my brother or with my brother-in-law somewhere else. And so, you know, in terms of organization, that, that requires a lot of, you know, I'm using my hands a lot because like, I'm imagining like these, these, these streams of people moving and goods and, you know, shifting around and agents. Um, so there's that. That said, that we have examples of rather well-organized secret groups, but they were generally pretty local. And that was always their downfall, is that as they grew, someone was going to slip. You know, someone was going to tell the wrong person. Um, that's what happened with the Carvajals. Um, Carvajal's sister, Isabel, um, was very devout in her secret Judaism. And one day there was someone visiting who was a converso, who was a distant relative, who she assumed was in on it. And she says, isn't it great that we have this great faith? Right, I see people like, what are you doing, right? And this guy freaks out. Now, you freak out because if it gets, if these people get arrested, let's say in six months, let's say in six years, and it turns out that you were friends with them, and you knew that they were conversos who were, practicing Judaism in secret, you'll also get arrested. So even if you didn't care from a religious standpoint, which many people did, this was serious stuff, heresy, you don't even go to hell with heresy. You're done, right? Right, it's, you know, you sleep around, you steal, you murder, you do whatever, all those sins, you'll, you'll go to heaven eventually. You'll suffer, but you'll go to heaven. You are a heretic, forget about it. That's why you're burnt at the stake because how else can we get expiation for your sin? Your sin is, is beyond. I mean, it's, look, as moderns, it's very hard to wrap our heads around that, but that's a, people believe that. Not, probably not everybody, but you know, that, so why someone would turn someone in? But so those, we, the, now the problem with, knowing about these groups is that we know about them from the Inquisition, right? And that, that was, Net we talked about this last week, that was Netanyahu's argument, right? How do you trust documents that are coming from a coercive, secretive group, 
that's you know threatening torture if you don't tell them what they want to hear and what they want to hear is i did it even if you didn't do it um you know so how do you trust so so you're not a binary thinker you know it's not black and white read the document what does the document say what are the telltale styles right there is like you read things and you're like oh my god so stock so boring it's the same thing again and again and then you like you encounter a case where it's it just blows your mind i mean this is totally different this person has very strange beliefs um i haven't seen this before no one's ever said things like this right um with carvajal we have this incredible case because we have his writings which is very rare right he writes about oh i spent pesach with these people i I fasted with, with this group of people. And he never uses people's names. He'll say, you know, a pious Jew in the countryside or, um, you know, the family. And I believe, you know, the inquisitors figured it out. Um, but the point is, uh, the organ I'll add one last piece of organization. I mentioned, I, th I think I might have mentioned it, so I'll apologize, but. Um, There was a, a large group of Portuguese new Christians um, in Rome. These people wanted nothing to do with Judaism. They, they had nothing to do with the Jews of Rome. They, they, they didn't want anything to do with Judaism. These, li these people lived like Catholics, but they were identified as men of the nation, men of business. These were the terms that were used. They were Portuguese doing business in Rome. Everyone knew, right, that they were different. They were incredibly good at lobbying the Pope on many occasions, either to get a, a blanket, um, you know, kind of a, a stop to inquisitorial trials, um, a, a, a pardon for all conversos. Um, they did this through politics and through money. They literally bribed their way to the Pope um, to, get, to get these injunctions. Um, so, um, that takes a lot of organization, right? That takes money coming in from all sorts of places. Um, and, and, you know, so, it, you know, at once they're atomized and doing their own thing. And at the same time, you're dealing with a lot of larger structures that are very impressive, um, you know, so. Dr. Perales, let me uh, take you to the chat for a second. Great. A question came in about saying more about the auto de fe and what it meant to Diego Rivera and how you know who the woman is. Uh, the Inquisition in Mexico and did murders take place there? And then a uh, piece I'll let you read about Columbus and his family and the Jews in Converso. So whichever you want to take on first. Okay. So, um, so, so by the time, you know, Diego Rivera, um, that panel is is all about kind of the colonial period. And it has, it has a lot of um, famous colonial um, figures who were persecuted for their ideas and beliefs. Like right below Mariana is Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, who was this amazingly interesting nun. She was, uh, she was, she was a scientist and, and such a good poet that she was called the 10th muse or the American muse, or the, she had all these different names for her. Um, her poetry was, print, was published in Spain to great acclaim. And Netflix has a nice series. They call it Sor Juana. Um, it's actually very nicely done. So like she's right below Mariana de Carvajal. Now, the, what's interesting is, you know, as Jews, we care about this history because we see it as Jewish history, right? For those of us who do, there are people who argue this isn't Jewish history, which that's an interesting debate, um, right? But in Mexico, with the, once the Spanish were kicked out in the 1820s, Mexican culture and Mexican national identity was often built as anti-colonialist, anti-Spanish imperialist, and often, despite the fact that Mexico is a deeply, you know, faithful country, uh, Catholic country, also very anti-clerical, very anti-church. Um, and, you know, it's one of, so what better way to do, to hit all the boxes 
than to study and, um, and talk about the Inquisition. So the Inquisition, which you know, had these great archives that were never burnt or lost in a flood or anything like that, um, became part of the, 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 the National Archive of Mexico and were a great resource for historians to reproduce, you know, to think about life in colonial Mexico, but also as a way to kind of say, look what we have left behind. We left behind all those superstitions and all the fanaticism and all that terrible Spanish stuff. We're now free of that persecution and that persecutorial way of looking at the world. Um, and so Diego Rivera makes a lot of sense that he would, he would celebrate someone who was known about. Now, why Mariana de Carvajal, not Luis? I don't know, right? I, I, it's curious. It must have been some book he read. There were plenty of popular books about, already from the, the late 19th century, there was a collection called uh, The Red Book, which had, had like, like exemplary stories of, of inquisitorial persecution. Um, that would have been known to him. And, and, and they, were, they were also illustrated. They had all these crazy scenes of torture and you know, very macabre and kind of like walking into a Mexican church where like there's an inordinate amount of blood and wounds and spikes and stuff, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's along those lines. Um, oh, wait, so there was another- murders, about, how, you know, how, how long did the murders go in Mexico? So um, the Inquisition, in the Iberian world lasted as long as the Iberian empires to a great extent. So with the overthrow of the Spanish empire in the Americas um, in the 1820s, you have the demolishing of the Inquisition in the Americas. Um, in Spain, it was the French, the Napoleonic invasions, uh, which were not pretty. One nice thing that happened is that they, 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 just, they shut down the Inquisition. But those, you know, the famous Goya painting of, of the, you know, the guy with his hands up. Um, so that's from that, those wars. But I can say one good thing that happened with those wars is that they shut down the Inquisition. Um, but by the end of the 18th century, it's very, very defunct. There's very few cases, very few um, out of the phase happening. And when they do, it's, it's, it, it's for it's not a strong institution at that point. Um, also, you know, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is numbers to some extent. Um, I don't do numbers very much, but there are those historians who do, and they've shown that if you would compare the Inquisition to other forms of of you know of of capital punishment, you know, the use of capital punishment in other jurisdictions, it's it's rather light. Um, same is true with torture. Torture was a standard interrog interrogatory, you know, method throughout Europe. Um, it was used the Inquisition um, under very, very tight circumstances. I don't want to sound like an apologist here. I, the last thing I, I would do, but it's important to keep in mind the the terror of the Inquisition, in my understanding, is not the amount of actual blood that was shed because of it. Um, it was in the fear, in the chill that it can put on an environment, on a culture, um, and the way it destroyed lives. Uh, when you're arrested, they take your goods and they use it to support you in prison. You pay your own prison. Yeah. Let me, let me just follow up on that one before we get to the question about Columbus and the New World and whether Columbus was uh, trying to provide a safe place for Jews and conversos, according to Kritzler, the Kohlers asked. Um, but when we think about the Inquisition and the Inquisitors and the torture, as you said, and there is a sense that there was a lot of blood uh, letting and, and killing, maybe not as much, according to what you're saying now. But are, are, are you convinced that they were truly trying to be, as Lemkin would define, genocide in the 20th century? Were they cultural vandals? Was it to the point where they really believed that, that they were in need of completely erasing the Muslim Jewish reality because of salvation, because they were the uh, holders of the key to the realms of both this world and heaven? Or, or do you think that they, they understood a little bit more that 
they needed to do business, uh, do the business of getting the culture to be kind of, in some, some, some sense, monolithic, but that they couldn't really erase these folks and they didn't have a real method for doing it. Yeah, it's, 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 you're asking like the biggest questions. They're great. These are, I'm really just taking them in. Um, and they're really hard to know because the church itself was divided on many of these questions. The, the Spanish church, like even among Spanish theologians and Spanish thinkers. Um, first of all, the question of conversos. You have my dear friend, Claude Chutinsky from bar Ilan University has spent a lot of time studying um, the thought, the, the kind of pro-converso thinking of, of many of, of like the early modern intelligentsia in Spain. In other words, people who say um, everything from very pragmatic views of blood purity laws and inquisition, all this stuff just messes with things. Like just, it's not useful. We're, we're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to derail our economic development. It's, it's messing with our politics. Like, let's just, let's just stop. Like, obviously, someone who's a real heretic who's really causing problems, arrest them, do what you need to do. But we've become crazy. We've become crazy, and it's limiting us. And look who's benefiting. Look where they're going. They knew, you know, these guys are smart. They know they're going to England. They're going to Holland. They're going to Italy. Like, why are we losing out? And there were, there were, there were often like these these openings where there was these big debates at court mm. of saying let's rescind some of these policies and there were different ones and everything from like someone like saying let's allow Jews in under very strict circumstances they have to come they have to wear a badge they have to live in a certain neighborhood and and things like that uh, but we'll do business with them to other people saying let's just dismantle the whole thing um, so did Columbus did Columbus want to create the safe haven for Jews in the new world. No, I don't think so. I don't buy that at all. I don't buy that at all. But, but what I do think is Columbus, see, this is what's confusing about Columbus. Is I, and I highly recommend people read his diaries. They're very interesting and weird. I mean, if you like <laughs> weird, like quasi-mystical, and also like self-fashioning, self-promoting, you know, he, he sees himself on a messianic mission but it's a Christian messianic vision, right? Um, he changed his name from, from Cristobal to Christophorus, right? To the, the, um, the, the, the one who brings the cross. He saw himself as like, I'm bringing the truth to the, to the world. These people never knew about it. Um, but something else, he also invokes, I'll say it like this, he's a product, right? He's a autodidact. He lived in a time when books were booming, where the, the expansion of vernacular literature, like stuff that was only for the elite, are now in translations and in anthologies. He, we know he was very, very interested in, um, in Joachim of Fiora, who was a 13th century mystic, Franciscan mystic, who had all sorts of really whacked out ideas about different stages in, in, in human history. And he had a very important place for Jews. He believed that like the Jews were going to come in at a certain point and be a very important stage. And so he invokes a lot of, we, we are most historians, you know, the historians who study this stuff, they believe he had a connection to Abram Abu Lafia, the very out there mystic in Italy. Um, and that, you know, so he, so someone like Columbus could draw on all sorts of like a, like a, like a, a smorgasbord of, of Jewish mystical ideas and this, you know, kind of from all over the place and then kind of cobble them together into his own very idiosyncratic. And he's autodidact. He's not, he didn't, wasn't trained to think, oh, I have to read all the books and then I'll write a summary and then I'll, right, he's free. So he's saying, oh, this must be, you know, he gets to the Orinoco River in Venezuela and he says, he starts noticing some, he makes some measurements and he says, he says, this must be the river leaving terrestrial paradise. So he's not any, there's no reason to believe that he loved Jews or anything like, I mean, he had conversos on the boat. Remember, converso is, is, it could be a very, very devout Catholic. 
Um, he, we know that he had conversos on the boat. We know the name of one for sure, uh, who was his translator, who he talks about, that he's excited that this guy, because he knows Hebrew and Arabic and Chaldean, right? He knows Aramaic. <laughs> so, you know, that's going to be very useful when you get to China and Japan, um, which, by the way, he thought Cuba was Japan, or could be because of the shape. It's just wrong. It's fine. He didn't have a map. What is he supposed to know? He's making it up as he goes along, and he also needs to convince the Catholic monarchs, Fran and Isabella, that what he's doing is really important. So he's saying, I'm going to find the gold, and then you're going to do a crusade to take back the Holy Land. That's not for Jews, right? This isn't about Jews. So he had, he had a translator with him, a converso. Uh, but let's talk bigger picture. Uh, yeah. Arlene Shelley wrote a comment that slash a question, you know, so are we down thousands? Are we down 10,000, oh. 100,000? Are we potentially missing from the family tree a million Jews? Uh, what, what, uh, you, you said you don't do numbers particularly, but what are some of the, 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 the trending numbers with- Oh, it has to be huge. I mean, How think about it. It, 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 you know, Spain at, at the eve of the expulsion was the largest community and almost probably half of the Jews stayed behind as, you know, converted. So, you know, think about that. Like what would have been, right? Spooling out into, into, the, into the future from those numbers. Um, you know, one of the, one of the interesting uh, and difficult to understand, you know, for demographers, uh, uh, realities is that around 1492, the majority of the Jews, maybe, maybe 70, 80 percent, live either in Spain or the Islamic world. So North Africa, Middle East, and Spain, Turkey, and about 20 percent, 10 percent live in Ashkenaz, right, in Poland. After the within 300 years, that flips. You know, by the time you get to the 19th century, about 80, 90% of the Jews of the world live in Eastern Europe. Mm. You know, like what happened there? So I'm sure a, this is a big piece of it. When you have the, the largest community, it gets, you know, it gets halved. Um, the numbers. Big, big numbers. Uh, let's go back to, to, the, to the core uh, moment here. Yeah. 1492 and the great crisis of that moment. Here we were hundreds and hundreds of years, if not more, from Ovadia's mention of Sparad in the, in the Tanakh. Uh, we've been part of the culture on the Iberian Peninsula, and then it seems like Jews are just not welcome any longer. And of course, some made it to Portugal, and the mass conversion happened. Seems to be, according to one of the comments Bert wrote, a, a, a big difference between Spanish Jews and Portuguese Jews. Maybe it's not so much between Spanish and Portuguese, but uh, maybe maybe there's something that happened in Portugal that got people kind of spread throughout the world that kind of got them into a global mindset. Was it there that they got that mindset? Was it back in Spain that they already had a little taste for it because Seville was becoming that Port that was the gateway to the world and the Spanish Empire, but did Portugal have a, a different kind of effect on people? And what was it? I, it's interesting that you know, as soon as you see like parallels, and then you you expect them to continue, but they don't. In the earlier medieval period, right during the Islamic period, more Jews were incredibly global and and moving back and forth. We know from the Geniza. You know, Jews are going from Spain to Egypt to India, going back and forth. There's tremendous movement. By the time we get to like the 13th, 14th century, Jews are really staying in Spain. And they're, they're much more local. Um, they're less connected to the wider world. Uh, certainly the wider Islamic world. Less, not completely. But it's, it is Portugal. It's because Portugal becomes dependent economically, its economic engine is this international trade. Um, and then Spain gets into it also because of the Americas. But mm -hmm. Portugal was doing it already for almost 100 years before, right? They're exploring the, the Atlantic, the African coast for, for decades before Columbus. You know, Columbus goes to them first 
And they're like, no, we kind of have it figured out. We're like slowly making our way. We're going to get there. We don't want to do this other thing, you know? Um, yeah. So, so, a final, so a final question and a good, be a good note to end on. Uh, we've heard about conversal communities in parts of the U.S., Jerry wrote. And uh, so where do we stand today? And uh, also, if you could just then wrap up with what are you working on now? Uh, and or what should we have you back to talk about that the passion oh, we didn't hear about? So, oh, so much uh, fun when we stuff. can get you in person. So, so what, what um, the American community today and then share some yeah. of you're working on. So, I have to say, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's, you know, in the earlier part of the 20th century, um, there were, you know, different, his, different stories of, small groups of people who claimed descent from conversos who maintained Jewish practices. In particular, in Northern Portugal, there's a great movie um, about this, um, uh, in the Jews of Belmonte and the now in the North. But these were very, very small cases. And then once in a while, people researching or living in the Hispanic world would often encounter someone who when they found out that they're Jewish, they would say to them, they would confide in them and say, well, you know, we're Jewish, you know, I'm Jewish. And you're like, what do you mean you're Jewish? You just went, came out of mass, you know, like what's, and so those stories, people who spend time in the Latin American world and the, in Spain and Portugal will have stories like that. But there's been an explosion in the last 30 years of these stories coming out. And clearly the internet has a lot to do with it. Um, I think the waning of the importance of the Catholic church and the growth of evangelical churches throughout Latin America um, is a big piece of it. So there's the kind of this new, this focus on the Old Testament as well. Also, it's a lot more, what do you think you see in trends among, among Latinos and in Latin America is that people will go to the Catholic Church, but also go to the evangelicals. You know, they go to Pentecostals sometimes and sometimes, you know, there's a lot more, um, it's more fluid. Um, religion, and certainly in the Caribbean, religion's very fluid, you know, all over the place. So, you have this kind of lessening of the authority of the church. You have a certain much more multicultural and, and mobile Latin American and Latino community, people moving a lot more, learning more things. And then the internet. So you have a suspicion, you heard something about your grandmother or your grandfather said something strange before he died. You go on the internet, you're gonna find 30 people talking about the same thing. Now, I don't have, I haven't spent the time, and I don't think I have the, the scholarly kind of uh, tools to really figure this out. I find it fascinating. I find it often inspiring. The people in that community, in those communities that I've met um, are, are, are very special. They're searchers. They're you know, often giving up a lot to find their place in Judaism. But where, you know, to what extent is this the story? Like that they are, you know, they're, they're descendants of some converso who wandered into the jungle and set up a family and, you know, and taught everyone Judaism. And to what extent are they finding this identity, connecting with certain parts of Judaism? You know, I, it's not for me to judge. I think there's a lot of different, there's a lot of variety. Um, and I think locally it's always important, but it's exciting to see and it's fascinating. And sometimes it coexists with people staying Christian. So you see these varieties of like, especially with evangelicals who are, you know, fanatically Zionist. And then they discover that they have some Jewish heritage. And so they also want to do Jewish practices, you know, and it's strange in Brazil, there's, there's a lot on this in Brazil. There've been, there are Brazilian scholars in Brazil who are working on this. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So we'll have to watch for those local reports. What are you working yeah. on? And uh, what, do you, what else are you passionate about that we should uh, just have our-, our Yeah, uh, so our, uh, look out for? passionate and, and working on. Uh, one thing, me and my colleagues at, at YU, we started this series, we do it every two weeks. We invite people to talk about interesting things. Um, it kind of grew out of the uh, difficulties uh, between Corona and the civil rights uh, unrest and all this stuff. And um, so we've been putting together the series. We've done everything from uh, 
We've had Zion 80 on, this wonderful uh, um, um, band talking about uh, fusion and culture and cultural appropriation and identity. Uh, we had Rabbi Saul Berman talking about his experience in the civil rights movement. Um, we had the librarian of YU talk about um, archiving COVID all these really interesting, uh, you know, shul bulletins and different. So it's every week we're doing something different and it's been a lot of fun um, to, to do. And it feels good in the midst of all this craziness to do something and have community. And uh, that's been really fun. And what I'm working on research wise is the biggest project is these Karbachal manuscripts, which um, like I said, were stolen. Um, we've had their, We've had these inquisitorial trials, which has allowed us to do a lot with. We've had a transcription, a very bad transcription of his autobiography, which I gained a lot from. But now we have the entire thing. And it's been digitized by Princeton um, because Milberg was an alum and that was one of his stipulations. And, um, and I'm working currently, looks, I'm currently working with a friend of mine, uh, Jesus de Prado, who is now in Santiago de Chile, but he was in Mexico City. And another scholar in Santiago who transcribed the text and is still working and we're gonna, we're gonna put together what we hope to be uh, a critical edition of the Spanish original with a translation and essays to kind of contextualize it. What have we learned and really see him as a thinker, as a new world thinker, someone who's creative, someone who's creating something interesting in the new world that's different than the old, um, who's parallel to some of the really interesting Catholic thinkers and also connected and not connected to what Jews are doing back home, right mm -hmm. back in the old world. So like, that's what I'm, that's gonna be the next couple of years. Um, wow. Terrific, <laughs> terrific. We, we feel blessed. Our first oh. summer scholar in residence and over Zoom, and it's li we're living history right now as Jews. We can we see are. who, who we ever are. studied in such depth about this age over these virtual lines. And so we, we feel like, uh, you know, this is new territory, charting new territory. Of course, going back in history and trying to glean messages for our moment or putting your scholarly tools of history to work in the current reality and bringing forward voices that can make a difference through YU is pretty impressive. We. Uh, we uh, know that the Ravel Graduate School, of which you're a part, and the work you're doing there at the university is much more expansive than a lot of people in our world are exposed to. Uh, the Yeshiva University, of course, is a, a wonderful home for many, many scholars. Dr. Perellis, of course, is a Center for International Studies scholar in addition to this area particularly. And as he said, if folks wanna look for auditing, uh, that's one of the things we talked about. There are lots of wonderful opportunities that you can, you can cross boundaries just like uh, one or another Jewish community member did and uh, would in their time back in the Iberian Peninsula. I'm gonna put in the chat, uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you. Uh, and I've mentioned thank you. there. It was great meeting you. I, 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 you know, I hope we uh, meet again in person, even over Zoom, I'll take Zoom. You know, if that's what we got for now, I'll take it, you know. Um, so thank you everybody, really, it's been great. And um, next time we can share the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be well. Good night. Good night, everybody. Be safe out there. Yes. Your presence is a lachaim. Oh. <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. More blessings for Dr. Perlis. Blessings. Take care. Be well. Thank you. Keep up what you guys are doing. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's a testament. It's a, you know, I heard one thing about social capital. You guys have put in the social capital. Now you can reap the benefits over Zoom. But, right? Okay, nice, thank nice you. Thank you, it. Rabbi. Thanks. All right. All Talk right. to you soon, Dr. Prellis. Excellent. Be well. You. Best to your family, and we'll connect again soon. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>